Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, we travel to Tulsa to look at a vegetable garden at the Southern Hills Country Club. And host Casey Hinches visits with the horticulturalist who built and maintains the garden and the executive chef who is showcasing the garden's harvest. We look in on the Roadside Monarch Research Project, and we roll on down to Atoka to speak with a watermelon producer. Southern Hills Golf Course in Tulsa and this looks anything <laughs> but like a golf course and joining us today is Wilson Neese who is the horticulture manager and Wilson I mean oh, how I come know. a golf course has a, such a beautiful garden yeah, like this? You would never think a golf course best in the country has some uh, uh, garden just like this. Yeah. But, no it started a few years ago our chef when he, when he came in, he always wanted a garden. So we started with two raised beds. I built him two raised beds. It was just a trial run. And then he was like, well, let's make four. So we got up to four raised beds. And then two years ago, we said, we got to expand. Said, <laughs> um, there's just too much uh, that we can do with it. And so we found this place, it was an old tree farm. And so we figured this would be a great place to have, have a garden. We scouted out over at the um, botanical gardens over mm -hmm. there at Stillwater, and so kind of found the plot system that we wanted. And so here we, here we are now. We have squash, uh, tomatoes, we got zucchini, some peppers over here. Yeah, and you're doing some crop rotation, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah, and so we made the system easy where each year we can just rotate our crops, kind of find the best area, keep the insects kind of guessing where we're going to put stuff uh -huh. and so yeah it makes it nice where uh, we can just kind of rotate each year and if something doesn't work switch it out the next year and so. of course who says you can't garden with oh, a dog I know. right yeah. who is we, this guy we, that's we still our in our show maxwell right here he's our <laughs> goose chasing dog and mascot for the golf course <laughs> very nice so. Well, yeah. so this isn't just a garden either. I mean, it's almost like a farm no, because you've got some chickens over here behind us. Yeah, we, we got 12 chickens. And so we collect eggs every day for the kitchen to mm -hmm. use. And so, yeah, so they're, they're part of the garden. We let them out during the winter months when the garden's not in session. And so they're in here fertilizing the garden and keeping the weeds down. And so they're, they're just part of the garden as anything. Fantastic. So. And what I love about this garden too is, it, I mean, it's a very pretty vegetable garden as well. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm not seeing any disease or insects or anything, which yeah. is just phenomenal um, considering it's already summertime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the wildflowers that you've chosen to put around uh, here. Oh, I know. And so we wanted to make this place look as appealing uh, as possible with the members coming, um, just being able to look at everything. And so we put all these wildflowers around for our bees that we have. We have seven hives of honeybees. And so this kind of helps them stay around and being able to provide the food for the honeybees. Can we go take a look at this? Oh bees? yeah, sure. Right. That'd be great. Let's do that. Wow, Wilson, you've got quite a few hives up here. Oh, I know. We started with two last year, and they went so well. I thought, well, let's expand. Uh -huh. And so we got four more, and then in the spring, I was able to catch a swarm, and so that gives us seven hives. Okay. And so, no, it's just, I I don't know. I just, I started to read about <laughs> bees and learn. I, I didn't take any classes, just kind of read through the internet and 
just really got interested in them. It's becoming so, very popular. Oh, it is, yeah. So. Yeah, with, even with a lot of different country clubs, it, it's popular to have beehives in them. And so, no, hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll have our first honey flow. Okay. So coming, and will, so. will that be used in the kitchen also? Yes, it will. So we're, we're all prepared for that. And so the kitchen, they're, they're really excited to have some fresh honey. Well, Wilson, I also want to mention you are a graduate of OSU. Yes. Well, did you mm -hmm. graduate in horticulture? Or? I actually landscape contracting. Okay. So I, I took a little bit of a little bit of everything. I took some horticulture classes, took some turf classes, and so, but yeah, ended up with landscape contract. And here at Southern Hills, this isn't your whole responsibility. Tell us a little bit about no. your other role. Yeah, so I take care of all the flower beds around the clubhouse, um, all the trees on the property. So I have two tree climbers that they work constantly keeping up with the trees, uh, different tree work, and then um, all the flowers um, around the club. We plant close to 30 to 40,000 annual flowers a year and about 17,000 tulips. Wow. So, yeah. Well, it's just beautiful out here. And, well, thank and you. I love your yeah. little hidden gem of a garden back oh, I here, know. also. I, that, that's what I, I usually are around the flowers in the morning, working with them, making sure the water is fine. And then I'm in the garden all afternoon. So, so I, I love it. So, <laughs> well, you're doing better. a fantastic job. Well, and thank, thank you for sharing yeah. it with well, us. Well, thank you. Highway 51 just west of Stillwater and joining us today is Dr. Dennis Martin with Turf Grass and Dr. Martin you've been working with ODOT for a few years several years actually yes. about mowing treatments and what the, what are we looking at right now? We're on a uh, roadside that is uh, looking at the effect of uh, mowing regimes on uh, prevalence of milkweed and also some of the plants that help pollinators do their thing. So you've been doing this particular experiment for about three years, is that correct? That's correct. It's a cooperative project between the Oklahoma Department of Transportation and Oklahoma State University. The departments involved are horticulture and landscape architecture and also integrative biology. And we've talked with you once before. Just give us a little bit of a recap of what the experiment is that you've, you're doing here as Great. far as the mowing. Well, we're focusing on areas outside the clear safety zone. The clear safety zone, for instance, is the first 30 feet approximately from the edge of the paved shoulder out into the ditch. There's a lot of uh, area outside of that, which there's flexibility in how it's managed for the benefit of pollinators, including the monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the research is to look at different mowing timings. The clear safety zone might be mowed three to five times a year, depending on whether it's an urban zone or a rural area. But the area outside the clear and safety zone, there's some opportunity to save taxpayer dollars and also accommodate pollinators, including the monarch butterfly. Because we're outside the safety zone, that's we always correct. want to make sure that's safe for people that might be having car trouble or whatever. But Absolutely. We want, uh, ODOT wants them to be able to see for as far as possible to react to a stopped vehicle or a deer that wants to cross the road, those types of things. So we're not talking about programs that affect clear safety zone, but the area outside of that. Yeah, there's a lot more land area that ODOT has to manage. Absolutely. Um, so this research is kind of looking at different mowing patterns. Um, you've got several plots and you're doing six treatments to the different plots? That's correct. Originally there were uh, five mowing treatments that Dr. Kristen Ball and myself were examining. Uh, those included a non-mowed treatment, uh, mowing around the major holidays of Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and uh, Labor Day, and then a post uh, season cleanup and that was to accommodate uh, lots of visibility and traffic on the roadside to be able to see for long distances but of course these are outside clear safety zones so there's lots of flexibility opportunity to save on mowing so some of the other treatments included uh, a mid-july mowing and then a mid-july plus 
post freeze and then a uh, after freeze uh, cleanup only. So there were five original treatments with some of the information that we've learned and what ODOT has actually integrated in the last couple years. We've added another treatment where uh, we'll be mowing uh, in mid-June and then post-frost and the idea there is it allows the monarchs to come through and also pollinators to use most of the forbs or broadleaves out there but also before the Johnson grass clumps are allowed to flower uh, it, it cuts them down so they don't generate as much seed. They so. can get aggressive a little bit on you. Absolutely. We wish our roadsides were completely free of Johnson grass but they're not. So. And, and behind us you can see one of the treatments that you've already done. This was the first Memorial Day uh, treatment? Yes, that was our uh, uh, plan to mow that uh, four times a year at the major holidays, the three major holidays and post uh, freeze cleanup. So it's been mowed and it's the area that's been mowed and no flags in it. Dr. Baum's portion of the team has already flagged the milkweeds that are out here so that you can see at every flag site there's actually a milkweed. Okay, and so pretty soon you'll be doing that mid June mowing as well, is that correct? That's correct. Um, that is uh, another treatment that's been added. And then Dr. Uh, Kristen Baum's portion of the team, the surveyors will come back and she'll see whether some of those milkweeds are regenerating at different times during the year, as well as checking for the presence of, of monarch eggs and larvae uh, at the different sites. All right, well, thank you for sharing the mowing treatments with us, Dr. Martin. Happy to do so. Dr. Baum, you're the other aspect to this research project. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're finding. We've got a lot of flags out here. <laughs> we do. So we came out and we flagged all of the milkweed plants. Um, so this plot in particular had um, over 600 milkweed plants. Wow. Um, and you can see most of the milkweed is um, setting seed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, probably early July will be when it will be releasing, releasing seeds. But yeah, this was probably our plot with the most milkweed. So. And, and you're already finding a few caterpillars on some of these milkweeds it looks like too. We did, yes, yes. So, so definitely monarchs using the sites. So in addition to kind of monitoring the milkweeds, are you doing anything with the uh, nectar plants that you might be seeing out here? We are trying to start looking at nectar plants. That's one of our longer term goals. And you can see we've got some echinacea um, at this site, as well as scurfy pea, uh, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorites uh, for native bees. And we have some daisy fleabane. Um, and so longer term, we're interested in, in trying to evaluate how those mowing regimes influence nectar sources as well. Um, and some of the plants um, would regrow following uh, mowing, um, some would not, so it kind of varies and depending on when they, they bloom and set seed, you can see very different responses. And does milkweed also, is it affected by the mowing? Have you noticed so that? So milkweed will regrow and it will actually bloom a, another time following, depending on the timing of, of the mowing. So Dr. Baum, we had one of the coldest Aprils followed by one of the hottest Mays. Has that affected the monarchs and also the milkweed? Well, the monarchs were slow to reach Oklahoma this year, um, and the milkweed was slow to emerge. We've been tracking uh, phenology and, and emergent pa emergence patterns on, on some milkweeds as well. Well, Dr. Baum, it's great to know that you and Dennis Martin are both still monitoring the monarchs and keeping a good eye on the population for us. Thank you, and if you want an update in the future, just let us know. We'll do that. it looks like it's time for blackberry picking. Yeah, we just started yesterday. So we had our first harvest, uh, took some up to the kitchen for them to use um, this week. And so we'll have blackberries for the next couple of weeks. Okay, so. all right. Well, I'm sure the chef's enjoying that. Can I help you pick a few oh, while I we're know. here? Yes, yeah, these are the, the Arapaho blackberry and okay. so they're thornless, so. It makes it easy picking Oh, it does, yeah. You feel bad because you're not coming out bleeding like you're, in, and so. Yeah. Are they see. all Arapaho? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all Arapaho, and so yeah, it's easy picking. You don't have to battle your way through thorns, and so. All right. Well, let's do it. Mm -hmm. 
Now that we've got our harvest from the Southern Hills Garden, it's time to talk with our executive chef here, Jonathan Moose Miller. And Jonathan, I mean, what are you going to do with all this fresh goodies? Well, this this time of year is always our, is always favorite for us because this is when we really start getting a, a good amount of things from the garden. So the potatoes, you know, are we have potatoes, all different types of potatoes on our menu. Um, I we did these on a wine dinner last week, and mm -hmm. we just simply roasted them with some really nice Sicilian olive oil and fresh herbs. And I mean, just the nice crispness on the outside and then the really light fluffy inside with the nice starch level of those potatoes, they were just fantastic. So chef, obviously the garden doesn't feed everything that you're providing. What do you do with you know these unique items that are coming in? So what we did, part of our, our struggle or what, when we started doing the garden was trying to figure out how we can really showcase these items because uh -huh. we only had just a certain amount of items and, and we serve such a high volume here. So it was always that struggle of trying to figure out how to make it fit. So this year we started doing a, a weekly special board, which is about six to eight items um, that change every week that really focus on what's going on in the garden. So we communicate with, with Wilson who runs our garden and then we kind of plan those out about a week in advance so we're, we know what's coming in. Okay, so it's not a complete surprise. Obviously, you know what's coming into season and stuff like sure. that. Sure. Um, are you still obviously buying some things though because you never know? We are buying some things and, and you know even when we plan something out for the week something might not be quite ready yet yeah. or it might be you know the weather might not have cooperated so we might be a day or two behind schedule. So we always kind of have some contingency plans in our pockets but we really always try to focus on as much of those items as possible. But I bet it's really got your creative juices going. It does, absolutely. <laughs> it's always a challenge when he shows up you know it's like feast or famine. Either there's nothing or he shows up and he's got you know 50 pounds of blackberries that we're trying to do something with and and a lot of times you know so it's, it's very spur of the moment so mm -hmm. it's always you know always fun to try to figure out what we're going to do with those at that time and what's the member response been to this fresh uh, vegetable sure our members really really love it um, you know we've tried to get it out in front of the members as much as possible mm -hmm. and the more that we're able to you know really showcase the items and that was really the struggle that we we're having before is getting them to know about it mm -hmm. so with those weekly specials now they look forward to it and they're really starting to gravitate towards those items. We're just hoping to see it grow and grow and grow and every year we kind of make it a little bit bigger. Well it sounds like a, a communication is a big part of it not only between you and Wilson but also the customers that are eating it. And, Absolutely. And with the way you describe those potatoes I mean you're a great <laughs> communicator so thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it was my pleasure thanks you for having me. This morning we're in Atoka, which is an area with, that a lot of farmers would consider watermelon country. And today we're here with Alan Pruitt, one of the growers down here. Welcome. Glad to have you, you on the show today. Appreciate it. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, this Again, this is, seems to be a good place to grow watermelons. Why is that? Well, it's good sandy, loamy land. That's what watermelons thrive in better. They, they'll take more wet, uh, rain, okay. handle it better, and uh, also it drains good. So this area hasn't hasn't always been watermelons, I assume. No, it, There's been a lot of other different crops that they've grown in this area, is that correct? Correct, yeah. Uh, peanuts, I think, was one that's peanuts, been here for yeah. a while, but it's not being grown right. Right, that used to be the big crop around here. A lot, there were some people who would plant watermelons after their peanut crop, or different years rotating around their peanut crops, but not a whole lot. Okay. What else, you grow other things too uh, in, in your in your properties Correct. or your land. Um, so tell us a little bit about that because I think this is kind of interesting. You And it's important, I think, especially for those who are wanting to grow watermelons to understand that you can't grow them in the same place all the time. Correct. I rotate them around. I don't always plant watermelons on the same place because they get diseased real bad. And you also lose the taste of the watermelon too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that is it some, some of the nutrient uh, depletion that comes from right. farming in the same, you know, yeah. using those plants in the same right, area? Right. It takes the natural nutrients out of the ground. It takes a while to build them back up. Okay. All right. So what do you do with them when you're, when you're, what do you plant in those fields when you're not growing watermelons? Sometimes I just leave them empty. Okay. Um, other times you might plant corn. Okay. You might plant, you know, just some hay grazer or something like that to, for hay if you need to use the field. Okay. Um, vegetables, I'll put them on there. You can put them back and forth more than you can the watermelons. Okay. All right. Good. Well, watermelons, I mean, 
they aren't they're they're a little bit of a challenge to grow right they are yeah <laughs> they're and you mentioned one important one is the diseases uh, right that's very common among the 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 gourds uh, especially right. the watermelons so disease resistance is important it is what are the things do you do to help manage the disease um, issue other than rotating crops big thing is just try to keep your field clean okay i mean you gotta i put down the plastic that helps keep the grass and weeds out um you know, don't put as much stress on your plants. I guess a stressed plant's going to get disease easier right. yep. than, than a healthy plant. Okay, good. So that's a big thing. Okay. Um, you're, you pl you plant in successions so that you can kind of carry that, Correct. that harvest season over a longer period right. of time. So when do you plant first or when's your first planting? I try to put my transplants down on the plastic the middle of April. Middle of April. Right. Okay. Try to get past that frost. Sometimes it's kind of close still. Okay, and then you plant about every two weeks after that in, Correct. in your, your fields to help carry that, Correct. that harvest season a little bit longer. So what's the first market time that you're trying to hit, and, and what, what are the best times? The first you... big market is 4th of July. 4th of July, that, okay. That's usually the biggest weekend, so I try to get everything done by then, my okay. first watermelons anyway. All right, and then uh, you can carry them how far, do you think? Um, the first field probably goes about three weeks and then my other ones should pick up. The next big market is Labor Day. Labor Day, okay. Yes. So you can carry it pretty much from July, 4th of July right. up to about yeah. Labor Day. Traditionally, Labor Day was about the end of watermelon season for everybody. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the times have changed a little bit. People tend to buy them a little bit longer. You know, there's more, uh, I guess, education about the benefits of watermelon out there. Right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. so people seem to, you know, nowadays they're more, um, excited about take, getting something healthy that'll help them. Mm -hmm. Now do you grow, you grow a lot of yours your, uh, by yourself. I mean, you start them from Correct. seed and then transplant them into the field as Correct. transplants, right? Yes. That seems to be, there's probably a little bit of an advantage from that versus planting seed directly into right. the field, right? It's easier to get seed to germinate in the pots. You got more of a controlled area, vi environment. Okay. And uh, you don't waste as many of them. Right, yeah. Um, what are the varieties that are most popular? What what are I, I know there's a few that uh, seems like consumers are often asking for. Right. I think one is like black diamond. Is that correct? Yeah, that's. But, I have some I mean, that's people. That's just one of them. <laughs> yeah, black diamond is an old variety of watermelon. Okay. It's it's still popular to a lot of people. It's mostly just the name that people have always heard. Some people really like them and swear by them. Most of the watermelons I plant are, are all sweet type variety. Um, Legacy. Pronto, Riverside, some of them, they're good hybrid watermelon. Okay. Good uniform, they got good taste. Growing watermelons for the local market, it's a little bit different growing them for, ship them, for shipping. I want to grow watermelons that's not necessarily going to last as long, but they're going to have better flavor. You know, shipping watermelons, you want something that's real sturdy and can take well, a lot of last, abuse. Right, Correct. right. That's, and, and I assume that a lot of those varieties that you're using um, are probably disease resistant varieties Correct. too, right? Yes. Very good. Um, so the biggest question that I think most homeowners have is how do you, when you go to the market, how do you know you're getting a ripe melon? <laughs> there, that's, that's a million dollar question everybody asks all the time. And it, the best, I mean, it, it's hard to explain. Experience is the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, a watermelon looks different when it's starting to get ripe. You know, the color will change. It'll have a few more blemishes on it. Um, you can tell a lot by the vines and the, how long the, plant, the plants have been alive too. I mean, okay. it, it, there's a lot of ways people come up to do it, but it's, you know, just experience and being able to bust so many of them and see if they're ripe or not. Right. But a, 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 someone going into the market, you know, they, they're Correct. just kind of hoping that they're close to being right. ripe, I guess. Yeah, people ask me. You can me, do the thumping test. I've, right. I've tried yeah. that. I'm not sure that always works. Yeah. Um, you can tell if it's over ripe I look by for color. it easily. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, thanks, Alan. We really appreciate you uh, allowing us to come out and uh, see what you're doing. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, your melons look great, and I think we'll pick one out before we leave. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks for you. having me. Mm -hmm. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead.
Next week, we tackle tomato diseases. We have tips on entering horticultural items in your upcoming county fair. We visit a 4-H'er in Kingfisher County about a beautification project in her hometown, and then she prepares for us her favorite recipe. We hope you join us in for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.